Welcome back to our study of the writings of John. It's great to be with you all again. Today, we look at 3rd John. As we've done before this time also, we'll come across some familiar themes and discover some new ideas. So let's pray, and then we'll get started. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for all of the people throughout time through whom you have worked for the good of your kingdom and the good of our world. Thank you, Father, for people like St. John, whom you used to write these books in the Bible, through whom you spoke to teach us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Father, for all the blessings that come to us through all of your word, but in particular through the writings of John. As we spend some time in your word now, we pray the gift of your Holy Spirit in rich measure. Teach us what you would have us know. Help us to believe what you teach us and to live what we believe. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. Let's go straight to John's words. Look at 3 John verses 1 to 4. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Just as he did in his second epistle, in this epistle also, John addresses himself as the elder. We spoke about the meaning of this word and the reason why John used it when we looked at second John. Second John was written to a particular local congregation. This epistle was written to one specific individual, a man named Gaius, a name that appears five times in the New Testament. In Acts 19, we read about a Gaius who was known to be a Christian and was a traveling companion of St. Paul in Macedonia. In Acts 20, we read about a Gaius who had a residence in a place called Derby and was one of seven people traveling with St. Paul who were waiting for him in a place called Troas. In 1 Corinthians, we read about a Gaius who had a home in Corinth and was one of the few people that St. Paul personally baptized. This Gaius was a member of the church in Corinth that St. Paul started. And in Romans 16, where St. Paul is writing his final greetings to the church in Rome, there is the mention of a Gaius who is identified as Paul's host and also the man who offered his home for use by the church in the city from which Paul was writing. There were home churches back then, and Gaius had a church in his home. The last mention of a man named Gaius is in the one in today's reading in 3 John. Nothing in the epistle tells us if this Gaius in 3 John is the same person as one of the other Gaiuses, who are mentioned in the New Testament. There's no way for us to know with any kind of certainty if there was any connection or not. What we do know is that the name Gaius was a very common name and some famous people were called by that name. The full name of Julius Caesar was Gaius Julius Caesar. And the full name of his adopted son Octavius was Gaius Octavius, and this is the man who later came to be known as Emperor Augustus, the first Roman emperor. The origin of the name is not clearly known. Some suggest that it's a derivation from the Latin verb gaudare, which means to rejoice. And some also suggest that the names in our language, Galen, Galen, and Gaylord, are modern equivalents of the name Gaius. All we know for, with certainty about this particular Gaius is what we have in this epistle in 3 John. And it's not very much. Whoever he was, John addressed him as beloved. 
someone John loved in truth. As he did in his other epistles, here also John uses the word agape for love. And we've spoken about agape at length. The opening line of this epistle then reads this way. The elder to the agape Gaius, whom I agape in truth. There is no indication in the text of what John meant by the expression love in truth. The word appears five times in this short epistle, the word truth, and the word true appears one time. We don't know if the expression was meant to state that John truly loved Gaius, as in really, really loved him. We know that truth is a big word in John's vocabulary, and John cared a great deal about truth and the need to distinguish it from error. We also know that John identified Jesus as the truth. In his gospel, John quoted Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Perhaps this was John's way of saying that he loved Gaius in Jesus. It was a relationship very similar to relationships that we have with people who are very important to us because they're part of our church. We know them from church. John refers to Gaius as beloved, agape, five separate times in this short epistle. Whoever this man was, his relationship with John was obviously very close. John continued his words of greeting with a prayer for Gaius, that all was well with him and that he was in good health, both in body and in soul. There's a wonderful hymn titled, It Is Well With My Soul. I love that hymn. This is where that hymn title comes from, from this epistle of John. We've spoken about the hymn before and perhaps you're familiar with the story behind it. It was written by Horatio Spafford after a succession of traumatic events in his life that made his life pretty much the same like the life of Job in the Bible. First, his four-year-old son died. Then he lost all of his property and the income it was making for him in the great Chicago fire of 1871. Then just two years later, there was an economic downturn in the United States and he lost even more of his wealth. But the very worst calamity of his life was the loss of all four of his daughters at sea. The family had planned to travel to Europe for a while, to just have some time away from all the sadness at home. But at the last minute, there was a change of plans. Spafford had to stay home to take care of some affairs, and so his wife and daughters sailed ahead of him. The ship they were all on collided with another ship in the middle of the ocean and sank rapidly. All four of his daughters were lost at sea. Only his wife survived. And she sent a telegram back to Spafford that had only two words in it, saved alone. Spafford was all alone when he received the telegram, more grief coming into his life. As soon as it was possible, he sailed to join his grieving wife. As the ship that he was on passed near where his daughters had drowned, he wrote the words of the great hymn, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, 
thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. What an extraordinary confession of faith. Spafford was inspired by the words that St. John wrote to Gaius. John's letter to Gaius was written after some believers John identified as brothers had seen Gaius, they had been with Gaius, and had returned to John and given him a report of their visit. Brothers is a term regularly used in scripture to refer to fellow believers. The brothers who had gone to see Gaius returned to John and told him that Gaius was living in the truth. There's nothing in the text to explain why John described the truth in which Gaius was living as your truth. There isn't any other place in scripture where your and truth are connected the same way. And it sounds a little peculiar, but perhaps what John was trying to say is that Gaius believed so strongly that he had internalized the truth about Jesus and made him his own. It was not just the truth, it was his truth. It was your truth, he believed it. John twice acknowledged that Gaius was living in the truth. First, he observed that Gaius was walking in the truth the faith and faithfulness of Gaius was very obvious, and he acknowledged that the brothers had reported that he was living in the truth. The fact that Gaius was living in the truth was such a great comfort and encouragement to John that he exclaimed, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Sharon and I have three children, a daughter and two sons. All three of our kids are very familiar with this passage because on the inside cover of the Bibles that we've given to them, in my terrible handwriting, I've written these words. I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the truth. For Christian parents, there is no greater joy than to know their children are following Jesus, are walking in the truth. That doesn't always happen. And for some parents, it's something they pray about over and over again all the time. Let's go back to John's words. Look at 3 John verses five to eight. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. If you recall, in the churches to which John was writing, there were outsiders who were bringing false messages, particularly the message of Gnosticism, and we've talked about that before. It appears that to, to battle against them, to combat those, there were also messengers coming out to testify to the truth, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And John commended Gaius for his hospitality to the brothers, to those who were teaching the truth, who had just been with him. We don't have any idea from the epistle itself what the purpose for their trip was, but we know that St. Paul regularly traveled all over the Mediterranean world to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of salvation by grace through faith. And it appears that trips like the one that St. Paul was regularly on 
were part of the life of the ancient church. They were common occurrences. People were sent out as missionaries, the same way that one time Jesus sent out 70 of his disciples as missionaries, the same way that we send out missionaries still today. My parents were missionaries in Brazil for 24 years. These traveling missionaries were sent out with no advance support. They were dependent on the generosity of the believers on their way. They accepted nothing from non-believers, people John describes in this passage as Gentiles, a familiar word. Gaius loved the church, John observed. And John instructed him to do his best in his efforts to support the missionaries who came his way. To send them on their journey, John said, in a manner worthy of God. Nothing in this epistle explains precisely what John meant by those instructions. It seems reasonable to conclude that the words a manner worthy of God mean do your best. Do your best by these people. Because we know that only our best is what God deserves from us. The missionaries went out, John wrote, for the sake of the name. It wasn't necessary for him to identify who he meant. Believers understood that he was talking about Jesus. And the next part, I think, is wonderful. All who supported the missionaries in their work, John wrote, shared in their work. They were fellow workers for the truth. I think that's absolutely wonderful. Chances are that not many of us will ever serve as missionaries, either locally or far away. God has given a variety of gifts, and not all of us have the gifts necessary for sharing our faith with total strangers. But, we can share in that life-saving work through our contributions. The money we give to support those who speak the good news of Jesus Christ makes us fellow workers with them, as if we were standing side by side with them. Our contributions matter that much. It's a tremendous honor and privilege. John goes on from this encouraging message to address a problem in the church where Gaius was a member. Look at 3 John 9 to 10. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. John's words about writing something to the church, there isn't any way for us to know for sure, but perhaps his second epistle is what he was referring to, or perhaps he's referring to something that we no longer have any knowledge of. Unlike the name Gaius, which was a very common name, the name Diotrephes occurs only this one time in the whole Bible. And the name Diotrephes means cherished by Zeus. It seems reasonable to conclude, because of the name that he was given at his birth, that Diotrephes started life as a pagan, the child of pagan parents, and remained a pagan until he came to faith in Jesus Christ. 
And we assume that he believed in Jesus as his savior because he was part of the church that Gaius was a member of. Nothing in the epistle suggests that he was not a believer. But what the epistle lesson does tell us is that Diotrephes was arrogant. He liked to put himself first and refused to acknowledge John's authority or any other authority in the church. We spoke briefly when we were in 2 John about the difficulty the early church experienced at the turn of the first century as all the eyewitnesses to Jesus and his ministry died off. And the church had to struggle with how to decide who their new leaders should be. It was a difficult time for the church and not all leaders worked together as well as they could have. Diotrephes appears to have been what sometimes we call lone rangers. He wanted to be the sole authority in his little church. And he was talking wicked nonsense against John. We aren't told precisely what he was saying, except that it was wicked nonsense. Whatever was going on. Diotrephes appears to have had a great deal of authority because he was able to tell people what to do and to dismiss those who didn't listen. He refused to welcome the missionaries who were traveling. He refused to welcome them himself and prevented others from welcoming them. And if the others did welcome the missionaries, then he put them out of the church. Diotrephes was clearly threatened by other leaders in the church and did his best to prevent them from having any influence in his church. What a tragic situation that had to have been for the believers in that church. It's so tragic in every church when the leadership fails. John moved on. Look at 3 John 11 to 12. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. Perhaps, because of the influence of Diotrephes, John told Gaius not to imitate evil, but to imitate good. Imitating evil is easy, and it often appears to us to be the best way. People do wrong to us, so we do wrong to them right back again. Serves them right, they had it coming. But that kind of behavior is the opposite of what Jesus did and what the Savior calls us to do. Look at 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus didn't give back evil for evil. Instead, he gave back good for evil, for all the evil that was done to him. And it is really hard to do that. It's much more fun to strike back. There's a reason why John had to tell Gaius not to imitate evil, but to imitate good. It matters. Whoever does evil, John wrote, has not seen God. But whoever does good is from God. We've spoken about this several times. Our lives are the only sermon some people will ever hear. 
it would be good for it to be a good sermon. John then mentions another person by name, Demetrius. This name occurs three times in the New Testament. The first two times are in the book of Acts, where we read about a silversmith named Demetrius who made life miserable for St. Paul. There is no indication anywhere that this same Demetrius who made life miserable for St. Paul ever became a Christian. And so there's no reason for us to think that that's the same person as this Demetrius in 3rd John. Whoever he was, Demetrius was recommended by John as someone who received a good testimony from everyone. And John adds, from the truth itself. In his resume, Demetrius had as a reference the truth itself. This expression from the truth itself is very peculiar and there is nothing in the epistle to explain exactly what John meant. If you recall, there are no capital letters or any other grammatical marks in the original documents of the New Testament. If the words the truth had been in capital letters, then it would be easy to assume that John was talking about Jesus but there are no such marks in the original text. There is no such obvious reference. So all we can do is guess about what John meant by the truth itself. Maybe he meant Jesus, but that's only a guess. Perhaps what he meant is that Demetrius was living such an obviously Christian life that he was following Jesus in such obvious fashion that it was obvious that the truth was within him and that testified to his character. John added his own endorsement for Demetrius along with that endorsement from everyone. And John made sure that Gaius remembered that what John told him was the truth. This little letter ends in much the same style as the previous epistle, 2 John. Look at 3 John 13 to 15. 3 John 13 to 15. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. I think that last part's really cool. Greet everybody by name. It's very obvious that the relationship between John and Gaius and the people in the church there, John knew them by name. They were very close. There are words in the closing of 3rd John that are similar to the closing in 2nd John. And I mentioned to you when we were in 2nd John that modern Bible scholars question if it was truly John writing these epistles because of his statement that he was planning to see the people again and planning to see them soon. To the best of our knowledge, John was an old man when he wrote these epistles and travel for an old man 2,000 years ago would have been very demanding and exhausting. At the same time, it's not unusual for even old people to say things like, I can't wait to see you. Even if they know, there's probably not that much of a chance that it will happen. 
even old people, have wishes and dreams and plans. And sometimes they happen and sometimes they don't. One of my favorite sayings is, when you get old, you don't have to stop dreaming. But when you stop dreaming, you really get old. And perhaps that was true for John. John may have been in his 90s when he wrote this epistle, but he still had dreams and he still had wishes and he was hoping to see these people he cared about, to see them face to face. He called those people beloved. He wanted to see them face to face again. Face to face offers benefits and blessings we appreciate a whole lot more these days because of all the time when COVID prevented us from being face to face with the people we loved. Thank God for the phone, for text, for email, for Skype, for Facebook, for FaceTime, for all that stuff. But you can't touch. When you're face to face, you can touch. And that makes face to face just so much better. And for John and all the people of his day, all they had was face to face and snail mail. And back then, it was really snail mail. John closed this letter with a traditional and wonderful greeting, regularly used sometimes at the beginning of a book, sometimes at the end of a book. Peace be to you. Isn't that lovely? In Bible times, this was the regular way to say hello and goodbye. The Amish still use these words as a greeting today. Peace be to you. It's like a prayer for the one hearing the words to be well in both body and soul. It appears that in spite of the difficulty of communication, there was a good deal of communication between the different churches. John wrote that the friends where he was sent their greetings to the believers where Gaius was, and he called on Gaius to greet all of the people where he was, calling each one of them by name. So precious. Peace be to you. That's my prayer for each of you. Peace be to you. We finished John's gospel and his three epistles. All that's left is revelation. And we'll start that next time. And before we do, it seems really good that we're praying for peace for one another. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the peace that is ours in Jesus Christ, for peace that passes understanding, for peace that sustains us in all the struggles of life, for peace greater than anything the world can give us, peace that comes from and through Jesus alone. And we pray, Father, that in your mercy and grace, in each and every one of us, you would grant that peace to grow. Again, Father, thank you for everything that John wrote for us. Thank you for all of your word. And now, wherever we are, whatever is going on in our lives, in all that we do, help us always to hear your voice, listen to your word, follow you, and love you. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. See you next time. Stay well. God be with you.